Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. We're going to have a webinar on Medicaid Monday, the first in our series that will take place every second Monday of the month at noon for a power webinar for 30 minutes, all on different aspects of Medicaid. So we're sharing our webcam right now, as you can see, and your lines are muted. If you have any connectivity problems or have a question today, email us at info at pierrolaw.com. And at the end of the webinar, we'll be answering those questions. We'll also send you a link to a survey and you can request a free consultation with our attorneys. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce our speakers today, Louis Piero, founding partner at Piero, Connor & Strauss, and Frank Hemming, associate attorney. Frank and Lou. Good afternoon, everyone. This is going to be a crisp 30 minutes, so we're going to breeze through a lot of topics in a very short period of time. We are coming back every month for Medicaid Mondays, and the first session, as you see on the screen, is the Medicaid Home Care Program in New York. Next month, we're going to cover nursing home Medicaid. And then the following month, special situations with regard to managed long-term care. This is all leading up to an annual event that we have, which will be our 24th annual Elder Law Forum, which will bring together experts from a variety of fields to talk about Medicaid and long-term care in New York State. We're very fortunate. We have Senator Breslin, who is now the chair of the Insurance Committee, and Assemblyman McDonald, who is on the Assembly Health Committee, who will be joining us along with Greg Olson, the Acting Commissioner of the State Office for Aging. We hope Mark Kissinger will be able to join us from the Department of Health and a number of others. So mark that date on your calendars, June 5th. You'll be getting more information about the forum coming up. And with me is Frank Hemming, who is our Medicaid in-house expert. And Frank and I are going to walk you through New York's Medicaid program, which Having done this in a number of states and had talks with attorneys across the country, this program, Frank, is very unique. And when we talk about Medicaid home care, it's a situation where New York is way out ahead of the pack, and you're fortunate here to have the program that we have. So, Frank, in order to get Medicaid qualified, there are financial limitations, and there are ways that you can meet those. And as we like to tell our clients, it's our job to make you look like you're poor without you actually being poor. So there's different ways that we do that. So the first thing that we always have to talk about whenever we're talking about Medicaid, whether we're talking about in-home or nursing home, is that you have to qualify financially. So this isn't really the webinar where we're gonna to get too in-depth to this, but you either have to spend down to actually be poor, or you can use a trust, whether that's an income trust or an asset trust, to basically make it look like you don't have assets or income available to you, and that's one of just the training strategies that we use to help people get the care they need, whether that's at home or not. So to give you a little bit of an idea on what we're talking about, these are the Medicaid income and resource eligibility levels today. These are all new January 1st in New York State. And we're going to focus on the home care program. If you are in a nursing home, we'll talk about that next month. $50 per month is your income allowance. But frankly, they have different incomes for single and married individuals. Why don't we go through those? Sure, so the, the now the new numbers, uh, I'm just getting used to actually saying them out loud, finally. Um, so if you're an individual at home trying to qualify for home care and get Medicaid, the most amount of income you yourself can keep is $859 plus a $20 disregard. So we always say, we just dumb it down a little bit, to make it a little simpler, to $879 a month. For a couple, it's not 879 times two. I jokingly said that would make too much sense. Mm -hmm. So for a couple at home, that's 1267 plus 20, so 1287 per month. And then the other numbers there, uh, that third number, that MMMNA number, that talks about how much a spouse is allowed to have if, if their spouse is actually in a nursing home. So that actually increased to $3,160.50. And then right below those income numbers are resource numbers but or assets. Just, just a point on the income, the MMMNA, that does apply to certain home care programs as well. It does. It does. And we're going to go through all of the home care programs. So if you're on a waivered services program, the spousal budgeting, as we call it, does apply. So you would be entitled to that spousal allowance of 3160 Correct. So assets? Assets, again, for one person, it's 15450 That's up from 15150 last year. A couple at home, again, you don't multiply it by two. 
So the new number for a couple is 22,800. And then that bottom number under resources, that's 74,820. That's what we like to call the CSRA or the Community Spouse Resource Allowance. That's as much money as a person can have if their spouse is qualified and for Medicaid in a nursing home or under a, a community waiver per, uh, service, like Lou mentioned, for income up above. So for today's purposes, this number of 879, that's a single individual income allowance for Medicaid home care, the married couple 1287, the spousal budgeting of 3160, and then the resource allowance of 15,450. Those are important numbers to keep in mind. And when we talk about Medicaid eligibility, we mentioned chronic care, which will be next month's topic. And most people are familiar with the fact Frank, did you have a five-year look back? Correct. That's whenever clients come in or we talk with community groups or on the radio or whatever, wherever we're presenting, people are always concerned whenever they hear the word Medicaid that there's a the five-year look back. And one of the great things we get to tell our clients is uh, the if you're talking about community, so you're talking about home services, even assisted living, if Medicaid covers that, there's no look back period. The look back only comes into play if you're talking about chronic care, Medicaid for a nursing home. So unfortunately, we have clients come to us every day, and many times they have made phone calls, they've called different places and asked, well, can I get Medicaid? And in many of those situations, they say, well, I have 1500 a month of income. And they say, well, no, you're not qualified for Medicaid, when in fact you can be. And I have more than 15450 in assets. Well, you're not qualified for Medicaid, but again, in fact, you can be. And for community Medicaid, which we're going to focus on today, that Medicaid eligibility can be created and put in place in as little as one month. So for Medicaid, community Medicaid, forget about the five-year look back. And if you take away any nugget from today's presentation, it is that you can qualify for community-based benefits in one month. And we'll give you some examples, but we have trust planning available. We'll get, we'll get into that more next month. But for assets, there's something called a Medicaid Asset Protection Trust, which you can shift your home, bank accounts, brokerage accounts, et cetera, into. And that will take those assets off the table. So as Frank said, you will look as though you're eligible, even though the assets simply moved into a trust. Your IRAs and 401ks are exempt. You don't have to transfer those. If you're in payment status, which would include getting a required minimum distribution, your IRAs and 401ks are fully exempt for Medicaid purposes. Again, one of the myths out there that you have to liquidate your IRA, not true. It's already exempt. So you can move other assets into the Medicaid trust, your home, bank accounts, brokerage accounts, et cetera. Your IRAs, 401ks are already protected. And that leaves us with income. And for income, that $879 per month for a single individual can be overcome using another type of trust. And Frank, that's called a pooled income trust. Correct. We use them, I would say, in 90, 95% of our home care cases, just because most people between their social security and any pensions or veterans or RMDs or income from any other sources are easily above that $879. So we use the income trust or the pooled trust to take the excess income over the 879. It gets put in an account for mom, dad, brother, sister, whoever we're applying for Medicaid for. And then the family has access to that excess income to use for the Medicaid applicant every month for the things that they need. So the best part about it that we can tell clients is we can use that excess income for things for like utility bills, cable bills, um, to pay for food, clothes, sh uh, additional home care hours, if you, even if you needed if Medicaid wasn't providing them. So it's a great service that not many people are aware of that we use all the time to make sure that people get the care they need in their home. And we talk about this every day. So for us, we're so used to it, we sometimes gloss over the fact that these are all very foreign concepts to people who have not been through this already. So what we've developed is a flow chart that will show how the asset and income rules work. And we're going to be able to make that flow chart available to you. If you would like to get a copy of the flow chart, you can email us at info at purolaw.com, and we'd be happy to send that out to you. But once you see it graphically on paper, the IRA exemption, the Medicaid Asset Protection Trust, the Pooled Income Trust, and how they work together, what becomes clear is that 
from a financial eligibility perspective, we can create Medicaid eligibility in one month which is just not widely known out in the community. So tell your friends and take away from today that this is not a waiting game, at least from a financial eligibility perspective. Once you qualify financially for Medicaid, there are a host of programs in New York State. And Frank, you want to go down the list here, all the different home care programs that, that are available? Sure. So the first set that we like to talk about is under the umbrella of a managed long-term care plan. So there's the personal care services program. I tend to just call it the MLTC program myself. So if I accidentally say something like that, that's what I mean. The other program under that umbrella that we talk all the time about is something called the Consumer Directed Personal Assistance Program or CDPAP, where you can actually hire, fire, and staff your own case. So we're gonna go into detail about a little bit about how that works and why you might wanna use that for your loved one if you're thinking about applying for Medicaid in the future for them. We also um, use something called the Nursing Home Transition and Diversion uh, Medicaid Waiver Program. Um, there are different regional development centers all throughout New York State. The one we work with the most, just because they cover the most counties around our office, is based out of Sunnyview Hospital, but they are throughout the state. And then the last one um, that we don't see a lot of, unfortunately, is the PACE program, which is basically you have all covered services for a Medicaid individual kind of under one umbrella where everybody, where all their providers work together to put a home care and service plan in place. So again, New York is a very rich home care program. You see all the different types of programs. How do you pick one? How do you decide which one is gonna be best for you? How do you get through this system, which is tremendously complex? And there are services out there that can help you walk through this. We have had so many issues with clients going through the program that we actually have started our own level of service that we call um, <laughs> that we call geriatric care management, but it's a program that we have social workers here on staff. And it's something that we make available to clients to help in this situation. And Frank, we very often as lawyers can't do all the things that need to be done to triage a case. Sure. We, it's routine, I would say. If you, if we, are talking with a family about their loved one, whether that's their husband or their wife or their son or their daughter or their brother or their sister, where they're having some challenges at home. So we like to sit down and we'll get an inventory of the assets and the income and we'll figure out if there are documents in place already or whether that's something we have to do. But the, at, at the end of all this, we want to make sure that care can come into the home. But the problem is, as attorneys, we don't see the home generally. We don't, we're not qualified to actually go into the home do an assessment, figure out what kind of care mom or dad needs, or if there's things that can be done to home to help facilitate that. Or more importantly, I think, especially these days, is if you don't have caregivers in place already, where are you gonna find them? What resources are available? But that's why we have these geriatric care managers available, because that's what they do, and that's what they know. And that's one of the most daunting parts about home health care today, is finding quality caregivers. It's a challenge that we're facing in New York State. It's a challenge we're facing across the country. And in New York, there are meetings going on across the state that are being run by the Department of Health and the State Office for Aging, where they're reaching out and having public hearings and public forums. They just had one in Albany two weeks ago that we went to. And our program we call Ever Home Care Advisors. And if you want to learn more about what Ever Home can do, it's everhomecare.com. Dot com. And you can see the first step in any of these plans is a very comprehensive assessment. And what that assessment gives us as attorneys is a path. What path are we going to go to? Is it consumer directed? Is it an MLTC plan? The Everhome Care Assessment leads us down that path. And then we can start looking at what each of the programs provides. So the three types of aids for differing levels of care uh, so, again, we're going to dig into the weeds here, and it gets very, very personal in personal care because what you need has to be matched to the program and the type of aid that you're going to be relying upon. Sure. So we see a lot of people that, depending on where you are in the, in the progression of whatever's going on with your loved one, you may just need a personal care aid to come in to help around the house, do some bathing, do some shopping, do some light home, homemaking or home cleaning services doing errands from time to time, going to the grocery store because the person can't get out. 
and or they you know they can't easily transfer in and out of a vehicle or something like that there's a higher level of care when you see like a home health aid they can do a little more they can do things like bathing dressing those types of things most people think of a person when they come into the house is going to be a nurse that so it's actually going to be a person that's qualified to handle medical equipment or do things like that not every medicaid program has that available and and a lot of times your loved one may not necessarily need a nurse 24 hours a day they might just need you know companionship or people to help them around the house to do the daily things they need around that time but that doesn't necessarily mean it's a nurse and people ask well how much care can i get and this is the other conundrum the way our system is built, and we'll talk about the system in just a moment, we are not, the assessments are not being done to give every element of care that's possible. There's a fiscal element to this, and there is a money element to this that you will have to be advocating for your own care. And New York Medicaid will provide up to 24 7 care. So 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year is available under the New York State Medicaid program. It's quite phenomenal that it still is available at that level, but it isn't an automatic that you're gonna get approved for 24 seven. There is medical proof and medical evidence. So when an assessment is done, it needs to include a very detailed finding of what the particular tasks are that the person needs assistance with. It's called a task-based assessment. So do you need assistance with bathing, dressing, toileting, transferring, eating? Those are called activities of daily living. And then when you get deeper into it, there are things called IADLs, which are shopping and other transportation issues and things. So we have to look at the whole gamut of services for a successful home care plan to be implemented and paid for. We should know in advance what those needs are so that we can target the appropriate help and then start looking at the programs in New York that offer the different levels of service. So the financial criteria is one piece of this, and that's what we get most involved with, the trusts, asset, and income protection. But when we get to this level, we also have to know, Frank, the medical side of it, because when we go in and we submit a Medicaid application to the county, we need to know in advance what we're targeting in terms of the programs. Sure, the, the, what we don't want to do is have clients that come in and have one set of expectations and then by the time that they're done they can't get the care they need whether that's because they don't have the number of hours they need or they're not getting the service in the home that they need yeah so we work with our geriatric care managers to put a comprehensive plan together where we're covered from the legal side and the medical side to make this work best for for any client that we have and if you're in a rural area you're going to have more challenges just because you don't have the agencies available to provide the aids in those areas. And we work up to the Canadian border. I was up in Lake Placid on Friday. We work down to Staten Island. We work out to Montauk on, on Long Island and everywhere in between. And each county, each town, literally, is different. So when we do an assessment, when our care managers at Everhome Care Advisors do an assessment, they're looking not only at the needs of the individual, but the available resources in the community. What agencies can staff the case? Are you on a bus line? That enhances your chances of getting agency care. If you're not, what's available through the Consumer Directed Assistance Program? So this is really where the nuances of Medicaid Home Care in New York come into play. So Frank Managed Long-Term Care came in several years ago, and it's what we deal with now for most of our clients. Why don't you talk a little bit about that? So the, the way I always think of managed long-term care the, or the personal care program is just when you're getting aids to come from a local provider or local service agency to come out and staff the case for mom or dad or whoever you're doing the case for. So what's going to essentially happen is first you're going to do your financial assessment. You're going to submit a Medicaid application to the local county office and eventually that's going to get approved. That's our job is to get that approval. Once we have that, if we have well, that approval though, second one, because uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the first one in just a little bit, I believe. Yes. The second one is going to talk about how a nurse from a managed long-term care company is going to come out. They're going to meet with mom, dad, and any family members that can be there. And these, and, these differ county by county, they which do. MLTCs are available to you. They do. There's a there's available uh, a list online that says which companies service what county. So that's an important resource to know exists out there, because the last thing you want to do is call a company that doesn't service your county. 
But a nurse will come out, they're going to meet with mom and dad and family members, and they're going to do that task-based assessment that Lou mentioned. And based upon that task-based assessment, they're eventually going to award a number of hours that Medicaid's going to pay for in the home. But one of the biggest things that people don't know about this is that it's a capitated payment over the top of all of this. So the way that Lou has always explained it to me, and this is the best way that I can always remember it, is that the state basically gives one lump sum of money per patient that an MLTC company has. And that's regardless of how many care hours a person needs. So it's unfortunately, I think you can see where we're going with this. If a company is given X number of dollars, regardless of need, it's always in the company's best interest to keep the number of hours they're going to pay for lower because that's more money they can keep for themselves rather than pay it out for your loved one. And that's why we're seeing all these issues with long-term care companies not giving hours. And downstate, we've had several long-term care companies exit the marketplace in the recent past, in the last three months. So it's a, it's a system that has some limitations and you need to know how to advocate through it. So we try to have a care manager, if possible, at that meeting with the MLTC so that the true care needs of the individual are looked after. And also to prepare that, Frank, we get a physician's affidavit as part of our Medicaid application. We submit that, which is a very detailed list of those task-based needs that is hard to refute when you're a managed long-term care company. If the primary treating physician is saying that these are the specific elements of care that are needed. And when the state implemented this plan, they didn't change the rules in terms of the allocation of hours of care. So this assessment used to be done by the county and the county health nurse. And now the managed long-term care nurse goes out and does the assessment, but they're operating under the same rules and guidelines, but with this fiscal limitation. So as you might imagine, denials result in appeals. And we handle a number of those for our clients, both at the administrative level and something called an administrative fair hearing, which if you hit a wall and you don't get the number of hours that you truly need, we can do the appeals and, and work through that. And you get a fresh look at it. You can present your medical evidence. Even if you haven't presented it in the first application, you can present it later if you're out appeal. So the personal care services program, Frank, Sure. So that's that's really what's in front of you is just what we've been talking about. The doctor, we we asked for a physician's order or a doctor's note to accompany our application, just showing how many things you need assistance with. And then we have our first assessment done by Maximus, which is where a nurse comes out after your Medicaid approval. And they just really all they're doing is they're serving as a gatekeeper to the rest of the system. They're just doing a test based assessment just to determine is this person needy enough to need help at home under the Medicaid program. Typically, if you're coming to talk to us or look into this kind of thing, it's usually not in question whether the person needs help. We just need to prove it. And then following that first assessment, then the MLTC company comes out. They do their second assessment. And that's when you get your number of hours. And if this sounds complicated, Cause it is. Because it is. <laughs> and the Maximus assessment sets the low bar and makes sure that you have enough need to get into long-term care. And then the MLTC is going to set the high bar and determine how many hours of care you're eligible for, each of those assessments takes about three hours. So it is a laborious process and you want to be prepared for that. So you want to have good assistance through a geriatric care manager or life care coordinator. Ever Home Care Advisors is really there to do these types of services for our clients. And this is the one that I like the best because it gives our families the most flexibility. And especially if you're in those rural areas, you have an opportunity to hire your own help. And the state will then put them on a payroll, gives them a very minimal amount of training, and then they're your caregiver. The irony here is that consumer-directed aides can do far more than agency aides can do under the personal care program or the managed long-term care program. They can operate almost as a nurse at home and do things like ventilator care and very intensive medical services that other aides are prohibited from doing. So both in areas where you want to use people that you know and where you have a high level of need that an agency couldn't service, consumer directed is gonna be the answer most appropriate for you. And Frank, this is a very flexible program and allows a number of people to qualify. Yeah, I mean, we've seen everything from sisters, children, other family members, friends, existing healthcare aides that have now become kind of a pseudo member of your family. 
The only unfortunate thing that we have to really say about the consumer directed program of just who can work a case is the spouse cannot be a care, uh, a paid caregiver. Mm -hmm. So if you have a, if you have a case where you have mom is home and mom is helping dad because dad's the one that needs care, mom can't get paid. But any of the kids, grandkids, uh, other family members, more distant people, or just other aides that you've already been working with, they can all get paid through this program. And this is good public policy, because if we can get our families staying home, if someone could leave a job and be able to stay home and take care of their aging parents, that's good for the parent. And it's also good for the child or grandchild, because they can replace that income and have an ability to do things for their family without having the financial burden of going without any income. And this one is something that used to be used very heavily, but is, is kind of waned in recent years. And this is the Transition Diversion Waiver Program. And this is geared primarily for nursing home patients that can transition home. Sure. I mean, we personally in this office, we see a lot of the use of this program. If you have just a very needy person in terms of what kind of care services they need, and they could be serviced in a nursing home and they don't care to be there for obvious reasons. Or we also use this program from time to time if we have a very needy case where there are Alzheimer's, dementia, cognitive deficits, where they're able to get more of that monitoring around the clock companionship rather than because there's a task-based need for, for the home care services. So eligibility? You have to be capable of living in the community. Uh, the, big, the, the biggest take home from this that I think we can take, that we can give the listeners, because, because we're getting a little close on time here, is that the local um, service agent or the local regional development center for this, for many counties around the Albany area, is at a Sunnyview Hospital. They basically will assign you a care manager right off the start uh, where a nurse comes out and basically determines whether you're a good candidate to work with the program. They will determine whether you're eligible, and they will also get you set up with what's called a service coordination agency, which usually is just a local home care agency to staff the case. But you have that hands-on approach with making sure that all your needs are kind of coming under the care of one umbrella to get these care services at home for the person. And if, if you're not aware of all these different nuances and subtleties in the Medicaid home care program, don't feel bad. Very few people are. But in order to thread the needle and navigate the care that you need or that your loved one needs, it's essential that you understand each of these different programs, mm -hmm. how the programs work. And the next part is also something that I think is very important, and that is the timeline. And I'm gonna go right to our chart. And this is a scary chart, because you start at the top left, and here you are filing the Medicaid application. So all of the pre-planning that we talked about earlier, the getting, getting the assets in place in the Medicaid Asset Protection Trust, getting the pool trust set up so that you have your income sheltered and, and have that available to pay for things like rent and mortgage and utilities and food and clothing, all the other things you need to live that you can't pay for with $879 a month, the pool trust takes care of. Even after that, the filing of the application, the county has 45 days. So if we file April 1, May 15th would be our target date where we would expect a determination by the county 45 days later of that financial eligibility. They then call in the conflict-free assessment. And that's done by Maximus, as we mentioned earlier, and that's another timeline where we have a week to get that done and then a few days to get the answer over to the county that this is a qualified case. We then get a managed long-term care company in line to come out and do the assessment. And they then would have until June 19th to do the assessment and get that in place. And then we would have the, the agreement signed with the MLTC plan and we with these dates. And if you did it June 20th, you'd be rolling over a month because you have to have it done by the 19th of the month. And who tells you that? But you have to have all of this in play by the 19th of the month to get qualified for the first of the month. Otherwise, you're going to roll to the following month. So because of all of these delays, and this is just the reality of the system, and when we tell our clients it's going to be four months from the date we apply to the date you'll probably have services in your home, they say, well, what do I do for those four months? How do I cover the cost of care? So we need a contingency plan. And it may be that you're going to do that private pay, but there is also an immediate need program that was put in place to ameliorate this situation and to give people a remedy. Some counties have filed many of these. We did an in-service with Greene County 
recently, and they have done this over and over again. Other counties, when we file immediate needs, it's their first one. So it really varies county by county. But this is in place to give an expedited proceeding to get care in place in a matter of about 12 days. Yeah, it's it's really, uh, it's, an, it's essential to have a lot of the documents that you would need for the Medicaid application available, ready to submit. And you also have to have a ready, willing, and able physician that's able to sign some other paperwork for us. Because as you can see on the screen that's in front of you now, you not only need to have a full done Medicaid application, but you also have to have a uh, verification signed by a doctor that's a, that's basically saying this person needs services and they need them now. If you don't have that, immediate need isn't going to go through, and then you're going to get stuck back in that 45 to 90 day timeline that we were just talking about. You also have to show that you don't have available resources to provide the care during the pendency of the other application, usually the MLTC application. Sure. So that's a, a set of requirements for immediate need that are rigorous. So you have to know how to meet this standard. But if you do, immediate need is there to provide that care. And a lot of times people get caught up, they go to the hospital, they're in the hospital, they do their stay there. If they're lucky enough to be admitted as opposed to put on observation status, they may transition to rehab and Medicare may pay 10 or 20 days of that. But then there's going to be a time when they say, okay, it's time for you to go home. And if you want to go home, you have to have a plan of care in place. And if you don't have the ability to wait four months before services comes in, then you need this immediate needs application. And, and we're going to be doing more of these for our clients as time goes on. It's just the reality of the way the healthcare system is working. So that's the attestation form that Frank was talking about. And uh, we're nearing our conclusion here. The timeline for immediate need. And I do want to emphasize that we're going to be back next month talking about navigating the nursing home Medicaid application and then May 13th, the managed long-term care program. And if you're interested in the care management aspect of this, we actually have an in-house seminar coming up on the 21st at 5.30 p.m. right here in our office. And that's a caregiver-focused seminar that I'll be doing along with Nora Barato, one of our life care coordinators for Everhome Care Advisors. And again, if you want more information on Everhome, you can just go to everhomecare.com. There's our third Thursday. And you can sign up right on our events tab on our website, as you see there, for the caregiver seminar. And this is really the, the problem of the day, and that is the shortage of caregivers and eligible people to provide the hands-on care and how do we work around that? And that's the big problem that we try to help our clients through and our care managers are, are very vital in providing that level of service. So with that, we've used up our 30 minutes. I hope you've enjoyed it. Um, again, if you want the handout, if you want the flow chart on how the Medicaid Asset Protection Trust, the pooled income trust fit together, email us at info at purelaw.com and we will get that out to you in the next few days. And always, as always, listen to Life Happens Radio every Saturday morning at 11 a.m., 8, 10 a.m., 1031 FM. On your radio dial, we'd love to have you become a listener. And with that, I think we're done. Thank you all for your time and attention. Enjoy your lunch. And we'll, back, we'll be back next month.